good evening everyone uh, once again i welcome all the participants for uh, today's uh, webinar on prevention and medical management of cardiovascular diseases the, uh, the reason for choosing this topic uh, for this week is we are going to celebrate world heart day later this month on 29th of september on occasion of uh, the world heart day uh, we have come up with uh, the session on prevention uh, and uh, medical management of uh, cardiovascular diseases by dr manika jhoya sir our uh, consultant cardiologist a brief introduction about uh, the speaker today uh, dr manika jhoya sir completed his mbbs from siddhartha medical college vijayawada then went then on, went on to uh, complete his md in general medicine from kakatiya medical college varangal and then super specialty dm in cardiology from nims nizam's institute of medical sciences hyderabad he has been, uh, uh, he has been practicing cardiology since past 5 years in varangal and uh, it, it, it's real pleasure for me uh, to know him in person uh, such a wonderful human being and uh, uh, one of the best cardiologists that i have seen uh, Sir is uh, the consultant interventional cardiologist in Azhar Hospitals uh, since its start. So I welcome Malik Arjun Rao sir to uh, present the session, sir. You are welcome. welcome, sir. How are you? Yeah, thank you. And, thank you, uh, uh, Malik, for the introduction. Uh, and a warm welcome to us all. The, we post it in the chat box, and we'll be taking at the end of the session. Warm, warm welcome to all the guests uh, of this uh, webinar. so in this uh, series of webinars being organized by ajara hospital as uh, dr nadim has highlighted uh, upcoming week is uh, uh, 29th is going to be the world heart day and in this context uh, prevention and medical management of cardiovascular diseases and this was a topic chosen as we all know as we have been traditionally learning that prevention is better than cure so i would like to highlight a few points a few basic points for prevention of uh, cardiovascular disease in general and uh, ischemic heart disease in specific so 29 september is the world heart day so the theme for this year is uh, use heart for every heart so coming to the introduction uh, the most hard working muscles of the body is actually heart by in anatomy we are we were taught that the strongest muscle is the masseter muscle but hard working muscle is the myocardial muscle because it works uh, even we take rest our brain will sleep for over the night 12 hours per day but uh, our heart continues to work 24 by 7 as long as we live right from the 6th week uh, while we start in our uh, start our journey in the mother's womb heart starts beating and it will continue and uh, until the death of that person so in that way it is a most uh, hard working muscle of the body basically uh, the role plays between the supply and demand mismatch so supply of oxygen and nutrients to all parts of the body including itself so heart is a unique in that in, in that way that it also supplies its own uh, uh, circulation so it feeds it it feeds itself so what are the coronary arteries basically coronary arteries are the th there are three arteries which supply blood to the heart muscle one one vessel on the right side two vessels on the left side so these three vessels uh, provide circulation to the our heart muscle any blockage in these three vessels what we call as coronary arteries if it is blocked that shows uh, impact and what we call in general terms is known as heart attack so this is actually not a single entity it is a continuum here uh, from it ranges from mild to severe form that is heart attack so we will see what exactly is atherosclerosis in simple terms it is nothing but deposition of fat within the layers of the vessel as we have been as i am showing so normal artery on the left side and uh, atherosclerotic plaque that is uh, the yellow colored thing which has muck has which has developed and uh, it is narrow in the lumen internal lumen of the artery and that is the atherosclerotic plaque so actually one important myth uh, we are going to burst is uh, fat deposits in old age so ischemic heart disease is a disease of elderly what what we have been taught traditionally 
but uh, the roots uh, the the preparation by the god starts as early as second decade so actually it starts with, well within the first decade itself in the form of deposit of foam cells fatty streak development and then the uh, within the second decade starts the uh, intermediate lesions gradual development of etheroma which progresses over years and depends on it all depends on the patient lifestyle patient's risk factors and uh, uh, how his family history is genetics uh, genetics do play a role so all these things contribute how the etheroma is progressing actually it is no single point but actually most of the times we we see a mixture of multiple risk factors rather than a severe single risk factor moderate uh, intensity of several risk factors do cause uh, uh, this dreaded uh, dreadful event in the life so as the plaque advances as the plaque volume increases the fat fat volume which is superimposed by a clot one fine uh, morning uh, it is book described in books as uh, sunday morning in winters so that is how uh, monday morning in winter sorry so uh, where uh, the critically narrowed lumen of the artery suddenly gets total occluded with a blood clot which has formed freshly so that results in the heart attack which is an emergency so which organs are affected atherosclerosis the we always think uh, talk much about heart but it it is a universal phenomenon it involves many of the arteries in the uh, body like it has impact on brain which we call a stroke or cerebrovascular accident or ischemic stroke it can involve peripheral blood vessels whereby it can cause uh, uh, lower limb ischemias upper limb ischemias claudication is being the most common symptom where the patient complains of pain in the legs while walking that is known as claudication it can also involve the abdominal aorta it can involve any part of the vasculature and not only stenotic it may manifest as aneurysmal also sometimes so aneurysmal that is weakening of the vessel wall thereby leading to ballooning of the artery and it may lead to rupture which is a, a catastrophe in the next uh, the most important thing is heart that heart uh, heart uh, uh, which i have been describing the coronary artery involvement actually these arteries are very small arteries uh, they range from uh, around 1.5 mm to 3.5 to 4 mm so those uh, millimeter vessels will determine how our life is going to be so coronary artery disease uh, it can it is a, actually it can present in various spectrums that is no symptoms for long term that is a typical of a diabetic patient where may have where he may have uh, occlusions or disease in the coronary arteries but he they not there may not be any symptoms what we call it as silent ischemia it is typically seen in diabetics elderly patients and renal failure patients also and uh, next form is angina angina by definition definition is chest pain which increases on exercise and which is uh, relieved by rest that is what we call angina so it has several there are uh, book wise there are several uh, classification of angina but is stable angina unstable angina um, unstable angina is nothing but chest angina at rest which is occurring at rest and which is not relieved after rest and uh, giving nitrates there a stable angina is the one which where the patient has angina only on walking or effort and then it comes down after taking rest or nitrate so sometimes we also come across the patient history where he says walk through angina where uh, he typically describes like uh, while he starts his morning walk first round he feels some chest pain and he waits for some time and then he continues to do third and fourth fifth rounds as well with uh, with comfort the first round only patient had difficulty that's known as walk through angina another variant of angina is vasospastic angina where there is no real block in the artery but the artery suddenly goes into spasm there a cramp a kind of cramp in the artery muscle which causes sudden uh, luminal narrowing and causing chest pain typically vas this is known as uh, vasospastic angina or prinzmetal angina where the patient is usually elderly female and uh, next manifestation what we routinely see is myocardial infarction where the patient presents with typical chest pain and ecg changes and positive biomarkers like 
usually most of the times when we encounter a patient with the chest pain typical of angina we do we ask for a blood test known as cardiac biomarkers like cpk mb or troponin if they are typically elevated troponin i being the most sensitive which is uh, available in most of the diagnostic centers and hospitals and the extreme form of manifestation is a sudden death sudden death uh, unless proved otherwise we presume it as because of uh, coronary artery disease or heart attack so how big is the problem um, what is the magnitude of the problem still it stands number 1 it is the first uh, number 1 killer however it is declining in the developed nations the death because of coronary artery disease is declining but the incidence is not declining alarming increase in the developing countries this is this is where we stand india as, as we have been saying that it is a developing country and india is also the capital of diabetes as we all know somehow uh, and within india hyderabad is the capital of uh, diabetes for india within india so based on our food habits our lifestyle everything matters which i am going to run through in the subsequent slides so why we uh, this is the question everybody should ask among ourselves what about me where do i stand in this continuum of risk first point is genetic predisposition this definitely plays a very important role we see a lot of patients where they don't have significant risk factors except genetics that is a family history suppose a, a mother who has heart attack and expired or developed a heart attack underwent some surgery at le in less than 50 years of age and father who underwent the same thing less than 40 years it what we call a premature uh, coronary artery disease if he is having a first degree relative like father mother or brother sister definitely the patient stands high in risk in the continuum he needs to take uh, care right from his uh, 20s diet is one important factor where uh, it plays a huge role both in coronary artery disease as well as it help dietary restrictions it modifies the risk factors also what we call primordial prevention so prevention of risk factors itself like risk factors uh, means for example patient is having high blood pressure high sugar what we call diabetes high level of cholesterol all these things are the risk factors even before the emergence of risk factors somebody wants to prevent that is what is known as primordial prevention so diet lifestyle urbanization all these help right from the level of the start of the primordial prevention to primary prevention they also have a role in secondary prevention as well that is after developing the disease also to reduce its progression or to retard its progression this helps that is known as secondary prevention so most important thing is risk among the risk factors are the non modifiable and modifiable risk factors non modifiable are where you cannot control like your age gender race family history so age more than 45 in males 55 in females the 10 years buffer which females have got from god is because the hormonal protection that is post menopausal female is equal to male in terms of cardiovascular risk that's what we have been taught but of late we have we have been seeing even uh, uh, female patients where the coronary artery disc is evading the protection given by the hormonal uh, factors gender again uh, gender i have already told and race indian race in particular is definitely at more risk compared to the americans and family history as i told is these all the things are we cannot control that is non modifiable risk factors what we can control or what we can educate to the patient to by changing his diet or lifestyle are the modifiable risk factors like high cholesterol high blood pressure diabetes obesity smoking alcohol physical inactivity so we'll go through one by one all these modifiable risk factors cholesterol so many a times uh, we see people Uh, talking about good cholesterol bad cholesterol so practically uh, we see four or five parameters among the lipid profile lipid profile ideally should be done in fasting condition because most of the labs they derive ldl from a calculation by total cholesterol minus triglycerides will be their formula for right wall equation so triglycerides get erroneously high if you take uh, after the meal sample is taken after the meal 
So it impacts the LDL estimation as well. So ideally it should be a fasting lipid profile. HDL is good cholesterol. Ideal levels would be more than 40, more than 50 would be best. So LDL cholesterol, again, IEL cutoff would be 130. Uh, actually, guidelines say uh, 190 is the cutoff. If LDL is more than 190, straight away start medicines, like statin. If LDL is less than 190, but more than 130, it, that is a patient we need to assess his risk further. Like uh, we have some calculators based on to calculate his 10 year uh, atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease risk. The 10 year risk includes uh, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, is a uh, triglycerides, HDL, and everything. Also, there are several parameters obesity, that is the uh, abdominal circumference, where uh, they give certain points to each uh, thing. And uh, if the estimated risk is more than 10%, again, when the LDL is between 130 to 190, still, the patient stands in high risk. So ideal LDL in a nutshell would be less than 100. Ideal HDL would be more than 50. Triglycerides ideal would be less than 150. These are the numbers which we need to know and which we need to maintain. So obesity, uh, as we all know, body mass index is an important parameter. Ideal BMI would be less than 22. It is 22 for Indians, cut off for obesity, 25 for the Western population. So apple versus pear shaped obesity, where a pear shaped fat distribution, upper body fat is less and lower body fat, the like thighs, waist circumference would be high. This is actually lower body fat, pear shaped fat is better than apple shaped fat compared to uh, within the obesity type. Uh, this is pear shaped is cardioprotective improved systemic venous drainage, improved hemodynamics. There is apple shape obesity where uh, the upper body fat is high with uh, chest and abdomen circumferences being high but uh, lower limbs being lean. That is more uh, problematic for the patient because uh, upper abdominal fat deposition causes dysfunctional adipocytes, more lipolysis and uh, early macrophage infiltration and inflammation, insulin resistance increasing. This all is a part of uh, metabolic syndrome. So this, if these things happen, that is the plaque is progresses early. That is a atherosclerotic plaque progression would be early. One most important thing is physical inactivity. In this era of uh, social media and video games, physical inactivity is a very high risk factor, which is uh, starting as early as uh, from school going children, the second uh, decade itself. So ideal uh, guidelines, what should be the activity is at least 150 minutes of moderate work, 150 minutes per week. That comes to around 30 minutes per day, at least five days per week. Or a strenuous exercise, 75 minutes per week. That would be good enough. So these are the norms that have been told. They are uh, actually, according to an article, 20, at least 20 minutes of brisk walking it reduces the risk of coronary artery disease by at least 20%. This is what a latest study has told. As small as 20 minutes of brisk walking per day is good enough. So exercise, uh, whatever the exercise we choose, we like swimming or your favorite sport or uh, walking or cycling, whatever it is, some activity should be there in life. Smoking, and uh, if somebody is thinking that uh, we are smoking cigarette, it is actually uh, wrong and it's other way around. Uh, cigarette is smoking away our life, actually. Smoking, apart from cardiovascular disease, it has effect on, as we all know, COPD. It has effect on lung cancer. It has effect on colon cancer as well, as we all know. But smoking uh, is, uh, in combination with diabetes, is a dangerous thing. So I always, uh, most of us tell to our patients that uh, you are not allowed to smoke, being diabetic, you, you are, if you are smoking, if the patient is considered to be in a double danger. So smoking, it accelerates the atherosclerosis and bouts of smoking, it also uh, suddenly stimulates the sympathetic stimulation causing tachycardia. It might uh, precipitate a plaque rupture and thereby precipitate an acute MI who, who patient most of the times described that it happened after a bout of smoke. 
and uh, not to ignore the importance of uh, highlighting the passive smoking where sir a uh, patient most of the times they give history that we don't i don't smoke but uh, my friends or my roommate does a lot of smoking so passive smoking is as dangerous as active smoking so at least stay away if you are not smoking uh, if your friend is smoking staying away from that room at least for that period is a good uh, idea the next thing is alcohol consumption there was much debate uh, where uh, there was a french uh, in history there was a french paradox where uh, french used to have a lot of uh, alcohol but uh, their uh, cardiovascular health was much better so what they found out was they were they were having uh, they were more much fond of red wine actually red wine in a way uh, when consumed regularly in a small quantity it helps and promotes the cardiovascular health but uh, alcohol in general uh, has to be avoided but if the patient is a regular uh, alcoholic it should not be more than two drinks per day that is the norm for men and for women it is one drink per day that mu that much is uh, allowed and uh, other important uh, side effect who, for a patient who takes regular alcohol is the alcoholic liver disease as we all know it has secondary effects on uh, lipid profile as well increases the triglycerides it it causes elevated blood pressure so indeed it indirectly affects lot of risk factors for the cardiovascular disease rather than having a direct impact on the coronary artery disease like smoking alcohol is an indirect risk factor because it accelerates the blood pressure it increases the uh, alters the lipid profile it has an effect on the fatty liver and alcoholic liver disease as well so another important uh, factor for uh, among the risk factors which we need to think and consider strongly is diabetes the risk of the even though the risk of sudden death is same uh, for a patient uh, is whether the is already developed a heart attack diabetic versus non diabetic but 80% the most common cause of death in diabetics is cardiovascular disease so cardi uh, diabetes is equal to already past history of cardiovascular disease that is an event of cad we treat the diabetic patient whenever we see him we consider him already as having the coronary artery disease that's how we look uh, we should see a diabetic patient so ideally uh, proper diabetic control now there are a lot of drugs in our therapeutic armamentarium and uh, like sglt2 inhibitors early initiation of insulin uh, weight loss weight loss has definitely role in uh, to control the diabetes and to certain extent uh, reversing the diabetes in early stages so 10% of weight loss is recommended uh, to have adequate control of the diabetes uh, once he is diagnosed in regular checkups and uh, along with diabetes he need to have a look at uh, other risk factors as well so risk uh, actually there is no uh, it is not like a single risk factor comes in a severe upper uh, form like risk operates across a continuum there is no clear cut line and the risk is multiplicative that when multiple risk factors are present the risk is much more in majority event arises in uh, individuals with modest elevations of many risk factors than from marked elevation of single risk factor this is a very much practical point because uh, patient develops heart attack but he says my sugar doctor is always uh, very much under control but uh, if we look at patient as a whole he might be smoking he might be having some family history but his diabetes may be well controlled so uh, multiple risk factors need to be tackled at time early prevention so how to prevent a cardiovascular disease or heart attacks in general the first and most important thing apart from all these risk factors i feel is a diet so diet uh, what is good diet what is bad diet uh, people should know basically so diet uh, which is good is eat plenty of uh, vegetables plenty of fruits all those colored fruits which are rich in antioxidants <coughs> like uh, apple papaya and all those uh, uh, oranges all the and all the fruits which are low in glycemic index low fat milk and uh, less of oil less of salt among the oil uh, there is a much uh, discussion and debate the ideal uh, oil is uh, uh, we should be we should not take saturated fats like palm oil and ghee 
and coconut oil. We should prefer unsaturated fats and we should avoid trans fats. Trans fats are those, suppose if uh, we use the same oil for repeatedly uh, cooking the same different items that is rich, very much rich in trans fats. Again, uh, foods which are stored foods or canned foods we call, those are also rich in trans fats, those are to be avoided. And uh, in a simple way to avoid junk food and to take home food. And uh, within home food, taking much of uh, vegetables and fruits, that would be the best thing. And uh, take cereals, cereals more. And uh, there is one approach known as dietary approach to stop hypertension, that is DASH diet, where uh, they say recommended salt is less than 6 grams per day. 6 grams per day is a maximum amount of salt allowed for uh, patient in the cardiac point of view and uh, less oil whatever the oil you take take the quantity less and take uh, always we, as we all know omega-3 fatty acids uh, rich food is good enough like fish oil and uh, what uh, they have found out from research is that instead of taking same oil every month better to rotate the oils uh, like uh, once in every one month or once in two months rotate the oil. What we see the commercially available oil packets, they're actually a mixture of oils like sunflower oil, safflower oil, rice bran oil. These are uh, some, they give the composition on the back of the oil packet, which we can always see. Those are better rather than um, our uh, saturated fats as well as uh, palm oil, like coconut oil. These are things to, things to be avoided. And of course, uh, we bad food is uh, bad diet is uh, avoiding junk food, stored or canned food, a diet which is rich in oil and salt, fried foods. And uh, coming to meat point again, uh, uh, meat is lean meat and uh, low fat meat like uh, chicken and fish would be preferable. And mutton has to be completely avoided. That is the way it has to be. Egg yolk should be avoided. These are the things uh, who, uh, for the person who is fond of non-vegetarian, these are the things to be kept in mind. Again, fish, if somebody is fond of fish, fried fish is uh, again bad because it has plenty of oil which has already absorbed on that uh, fish. So better to take a boiled foods rather than fried foods in general. Even for vegetables also, boiled foods are better than fried. Uh, same uh, vegetable can be cooked in boiled curry as well as uh, fried curry. So this is how we need to explain the patient or the family. So always prefer boiled curries that applies to fish as well. So second rule of uh, golden rule is uh, physical activity. As I've been telling, exercise and walking are of paramount importance. We should start this exercise or walking as early as possible. It's not like once you're crossing age 40, that is the age you, you need to start exercise or walking. So, uh, early prevention, that is prevention of emergence of risk factors is a good thing actually, primordial prevention where you, if you do exercise, it has multiple effects. It has favorable effects on lipid profile. It has favorable effect in lowering the blood pressure. It has favorable effect on the reducing the stress on the mind as well. It has favorable effect on the autonomic nervous system also, namely sympathetic nervous system. We, a lot of times we see for a, uh, Athletes are uh, also do regular exercise. The heart rate is slow. The reason being increased vagal tone that itself protects that uh, person from the uh, cardiac uh, problems in future. Because the increased heart rate is again is an independent risk factor for the coronary artery disease. Okay. So regarding this exercise and walking, uh, one special emphasis need to be kept. Where um, like uh, some recently we have lost uh, some famous heroes or athletic personalities. So Ganguly underwent angioplasty, for example. Puneet Rajkumar, uh, expert of sudden cardiac death, presumed to be coronary artery disease. So they do regular exercise, but uh, there might be multiple other factors which might have been playing. For, uh, for example, family history is very strong for him, that uh, hero. So many things do come and uh, vigorous, too vigorous exercise need to be avoided, particularly when the patient is having symptoms. For example, if patient is having some chest pain one fine morning, even if she continues to go to the gym and uh, uh, do prolonged exercise, it's not good. So always I've been uh, 
thinking and reiterating to my uh, colleagues or uh, my juniors always give respect to history history i feel is the most important thing in cardiology with chest pain whenever the patient is complaining of chest pain take the history characteristics of chest pain always uh, give utmost importance whether it is aggravated by exercise or walking whether it is getting relieved by rest and radiation of the chest pain and uh, what are the aggravating and relieving factors these are the most important things uh, we don't even consider ecg or two day echo or a drop on a biomarker if the patient is complaining of classic chest pain definitely we give a lot of importance to his uh, symptom and uh, walking as i have been telling uh, 20 minutes of brisk walking per day is as good as uh, it because it lowers 20% risk reduction in the uh, risk of uh, heart attack so diet and exercise these are the two important things and rule 3 as i have been telling uh, absolutely no to uh, smoking and uh, stopping alcohol consumption or if the patient is a daily alcohol regular alcoholic moderation of the alcohol content quantity is desirable like i have told at least less than two drinks per day uh, in a male or one drink per day in female so rule 4 is uh, no your numbers as i have been telling what are the desirable numbers in each uh, get yourself checked for example blood pressure the guide needs to check his bp once in a year at least every person about 20 years old needs to check his lipid profile once in a year so along with uh, glycemic monitoring as well which is much more important if particularly if the patient has a family history of uh, cardiac disease this uh, screening and uh, number game starts much early in his life so coming to lipid profile what is important is total cholesterol should be less than 200 ldl ideally should be less than 100 hdl should be more than 40 and one more important thing which i have been uh, telling is exercise has some role in increasing hdl as well till date we do, we have many medicines which lower ldl which lower the triglycerides which lower the total cholesterol but uh, to increase the hdl we have very limited options actually one of the very good thing uh, that we have to increase the hdl is uh, exercise which increases the production of hdl apart from the uh, drug which is uh, niacin which is also there and uh, second point is uh, bp blood pressure is again more important because uh, the target bp is actually 120 by 70 only 120 by 70 So 130 by 80 is considered as stage one hypertension, and beyond 130 by uh, sorry 120, um, this considered as pre-hypertension or elevated BP that they have given the term, and beyond 130 by 80 to 140 by 90 stage one hypertension. More than 140 by 90 is stage two hypertension. These are the latest classification of hypertension patients. So the target BP of already known hypertension patient. target bp is like 130 by 80 irrespective of your age sometimes they have given some relaxation to elderly diabetic patients we they call 140 by 90 is also good enough and uh, diabetes uh, again uh, the it should be control should be strict fasting should be less than 100 post lunch blood sugar less than 140 and hba1c ideally should be less than 6.5 in a non diabetic these are the numbers uh, which every patient should know to how to keep control of these numbers and they need to monitor regularly if we know our numbers then it is easy so we can we know where we are standing it and it also helps to in the back of the mind for motivation of that person in general uh, and uh, also keeping in mind the family history so wherever we see some form of starvation is actually good for health from cardiac point of view or diabetes point of view so uh, whatever the diet you follow uh, well, recently there has been a lot of uh, stir about the diets new diet introductions which have been uh, for example the veeramachinini diet which has been uh, very popular on social media in the last decade such diets experimentations have happened in western countries much before actually where they have tried multiple diet patterns but uh, what uh, what is what important what important is 
most important thing is they need to stick to the diet it's not like i have followed a certain diet for 6 months and i have lost significant weight now i am i have i have come back to our my routine diet that won't help actually so the diet which you are choosing should be a sustainable diet that means you should be able to take that diet for a prolonged period of time it's not like i am fasting today tomorrow i'll consume uh, double i'll compensate whatever i have i haven't uh, ate today that should not be the agenda and uh, sustainable diet patterns are the ones which are desirable not uh, uh, periodic diet patterns and there are many uh, things uh, many proposed models of doing fasting as well like uh, 16 hour fasting over a 24 hour period which actually do work but most important thing is sustainable thing it should be sustainable that means you should be able to do that pattern on a regular basis that's what really helps actually so what i have been uh, observing is uh, some form of starvation intermittently definitely helps uh, in, uh, in uh, preventing the cardiovascular disease and what is the case if you are already uh, diagnosed with heart disease if you are someone you know already are diagnosed with heart disease first thing is be brave don't get disheartened which have we have already much uh, redu- reduction there is a drastic reduction in the mortality in the coronary artery disease thanks to our advancements in our cath labs availability of cath labs and uh, uh, stent te- advancement of the stent technologies as well and uh, newer biomarkers which we have been uh, assessing and uh, ave- next important thing is the awareness awareness we need to uh, rapidly spread the awareness of uh, when to consult a doctor when to seek urgent medical care what kind of symptoms are the alarm bells this awareness is also increasing so the overall we are diagnosing the disease early we are uh, starting the treatment early and thereby we time is muscle as we all know the earlier the treatment the better the life of the patient so always uh, never hesitate or never ignore symptom maybe we may go one or two trips unnecessarily to the doctor but if it is a really heart problem early diagnosis will definitely help uh, the doctor to pull our uh, pull ourselves from uh, the catastrophe and uh, if you are already having heart disease if the person is already having heart disease monitoring as i have been telling monitor the risk factors aggressively if uh, sir, i have i have told the numbers those are for the regular person who already didn't have a heart disease till now for a person who already had a heart attack for example or uh, who underwent angioplasty or a bypass it's not like uh, treatment is done now we can relax that's not the deal so he needs to be monitoring regularly he needs to see his doctor regularly like a target ldl for such patients would be less than as low as less than 70 is what is recommended so if a patient we know already having cardiovascular disease maybe it is stable disease or mild cad and angiogram we his your target ldl should be less than 70 he should eat healthy walk regularly keep a look on his weight absolute quitting smoking and alcohol immediately and one most important thing is adherence to medicines i mean listening to the doctor both the prescription of medicines as well as prescription of exercises what are the things which we not we should not do generally already a cardiac patient uh, most important thing is he should not uh, lift heavy weights more than 6 kg is not allowed best exercise for an already cardiac patient i feel is uh, walking is the best thing swimming and uh, f- last important thing is avoid what to avoid avoiding hearsay so many a times we see a lot of patients uh, telling that their neighbors told that we need not take medicines for so long these are all the not uh, the doctors do prescribe but these are the these high, these high doses are not required really or some relative who already underwent angioplasty may tell that you, even if you skip medicines also nothing has happened because it, nothing happened to me so these are the things which uh, many patients uh, uh, listen to them and uh, avoid medicines they take self decisions regarding the medicines and they land up in troubles so proper adherence proper compliance to treatment is a uh, very important 
for uh, uh, any treatment in in cardiovascular disease is very uh, very particularly compliance is very most important so this is where i would like to end my session today on the prevention of cardiac uh, coronary artery disease and uh, you can use the chat box for the questions thank you very much sir uh, now i would like to request all the participants to put their questions in the chat box but before that uh, sir can you uh, just list out uh, the medicines the list of medicines which the patients um, are supposed to take after the initial diagnosis of uh, cad and all um, sort of in, in order to prevent further uh, deterioration and all yeah um, once the patient uh, who is diagnosed with coronary artery disease he needs to be very compliant on medicines the most important thing uh, which has proven beyond doubt is a statin statin has a, a very important role it lowers the inflammation it has pleiotropic effects there is a, there are studies that statin taking statin on long term it even regresses the plaque volume there are studies so most important thing is the antiplatelet drugs aspirin clopidogrel nowadays we are starting ticagrel for the first one year after acute mi and uh, uh, statins and uh, and beta blockers um, again important cornerstone of our treatment target heart rate of any cardiac patient should be 50 to 70 so that's how whenever uh, we see the patient the we should we should always uh, see look have a look at his heart rate if his heart rate should be 50 to 70 once he uh, so that way we titrate the beta blocker doses and rest of the things depend on his heart function like lv ejection fraction and his stool echo report hemodynamics all those things play a role his blood pressure risk factors basic things uh, as i said antiplatelets and statins would be the uh, cornerstone of treatment Okay, so the uh, one question from Mr. Shravan Venula is asking: uh, Is yolk, egg yolk, the real contributor to bad cholesterol? There has been a lot of debate. Actually, yeah, some studies or some uh, conclusions were uh, that egg yolk is not so dangerous as we initially thought. But there is no conclusive evidence. Egg yolk definitely has a high amount of uh, saturated fat. so what uh, my idea is better to avoid egg yolk if you, you want to really want to lower your cholesterol numbers i think egg yolk has to be avoided okay sir mr mukadam asks what are the indications for early cavg indications are for cavg in general is actually uh, patient who developed a heart attack Who has come to us? For example, a doctor has done the angiogram. Diabetic patient who has having multi-vessel disease is a clear-cut indication for coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Early CMG again is a generally acute MI patient who is having multiple blocks, damaged left ventricle. That is, ejection fraction is low. Patient is having early pulmonary edema symptoms. hypotension that is cardiogenic shock these are the patients and uh, whatever i have told is very high risk subset so they need to go to early cabg again the prognosis of the cabg done in emergency is very not that good as elective cabg oh, oh, what about the role of dark chocolate and coffee does they help yeah uh, in similar to wine dark chocolate has some antioxidants which are known to promote the vascular health and coffee also to some extent uh, they do have some antioxidants they promote vascular health in the form of uh, avoiding vasoconstriction they promote vasodilatation as we all know vasodilatation is nothing but uh, um, improving the flow across the blood vessel so that helps definitely uh, there is some protective role definitely for dark chocolate and coffee okay uh, mr mohibul islam asks what are the warning signs of a heart attack in a way how to identify whether a patient is whether a person is having a heart attack yeah, this is very practical most important 
warning signs of heart attack are uh, in general patient having again i have told like history is the most important thing chest pain anywhere from our umbilicus to jaw and uh, which is worsening on ex- uh, walking or climbing stairs relieved by rest and chest pain which is associated with breathing difficulty sweating sometimes vomitings and loose motions where sympathetic system is also activated and uh, chest pain with breathing difficulty definitely uh, is a most important clue for any bystander and most importantly uh, many times patient discard it as because of acidity i have acidity since many years so this could be another episode of worsening acidity so what i feel is uh, most important thing is breathing problem and uh, character of pain if it is aggravated by exercise then definitely it is a, a warning sign of heart attack we need to check and apart from this uncontrolled sugars smoking status there are certain things which we look at patient high uh, high lipid abnormal lipids they have some deposits over the eyebrows as well so uh, there are certain things uh, soft signs even though soft signs and most important thing is family history for example already his father or brother had already had heart attack then we need to have a more keen observation of that patient or early and aggressive risk stratification that is how we see okay um, in case of uh, chest pain or cardiac pain and we suspect that it's it might be due to a heart attack and uh, most of us know aspirin should be given sublingually or uh, orally can you just enlighten on the role of aspirin and its dosage for such yeah. and this is very important from uh, many point uh, many people point of view lot of patients ask in this question most important thing uh, whenever we encounter a patient uh, with severe chest pain sweating and uh, for a uh, bystander if it if he feels that it is a it's going to be a, it's a heart attack for certain so uh, most important things that we need to give is aspirin clopidogrel aspirin 325 mg clopidogrel 300 mg and daterostatin 80 mg these we call it as loading doses loading doses are the one which save lives so we should keep uh, those loading doses in every uh, uh, house whenever we feel it actually helps rather than uh, sorbitrate many people give sorbitrate sublingual sorbitrate first point is sorbitrate doesn't have mortality benefit and sorbitrate is actually contraindicated in certain subsets for example patient is already having hypotension if the patient's bp is 170 by 100 you can happily give sorbitrate but if the patient is having some sweating and feeling giddy if he is 90 by 60 bp we give sorbitrate that 90 by 60 would come to 70 by 40 and may he may collapse and some kind of inferior volume for example some uh, subsets of uh, heart attack the sorbitrate will be uh, counterproductive so uh, rather than giving sorbitrate i feel uh, giving loading doses is much more beneficial and uh, aspirin is the most important drug aspirin that is soluble aspirin uh, disprin which we give which fastly disintegrates and it achieves early peak in the blood that is the advantage of soluble aspirin where aspirin is the drug which has highest uh, benefit low cost lowest cost so cost benefit uh, ratio is the highest for aspirin it is not comparable to stent or thrombolysis also so aspirin definitely it's a uh, very important uh, thing whenever we feel nothing uh, problem if we give a loading dose and after reaching the hospital doctor says there is uh, no heart attack even still uh, there is no harm in giving loading doses many of many times unless the patient is having suppose uh, some bleeding elsewhere there uh, unless uh, such condition is there for example uh, bleeding peptic ulcer acidity patient having bleeding or a intracranial bleed patient there we create problems but uh, uh, after ruling out there is general bleeding hemorrhoid piles or acidity uh, past history of acidity what i mean giving loading doses definitely helps most of patients even if it's not heart attack there is no harm so uh, is it possible for a 
for a young guy of 22 years old dying from heart attack i mean like what are the chances that people in second or third decade dying of uh, their cardiac issues yeah this uh, uh, it's actually a kind of pandemic where uh, it's upcoming where cardiovascular disease like covid pandemic we are seeing lot of pain in many young patients in 20s and 30s coming up actually they do very bad compared to 50 or 60 it's a we compare a 20 year old heart attack patient and a 60 year old heart attack patient 20 year old person fares very bad first thing is he seeks medical attention late thinking that i am not a vulnerable age so he he seeks medical attention very late second thing most contributory factor many times if we elicit the history smoking is the culprit in majority of the young patients with heart attacks smoking is and was a, a, a traditional risk factor where it promotes the clot formation and uh, because of the delay in uh, attention probably that is the most important fact they end up in a sudden cardiac death so that is the reason why uh, we delay in the medical attention because they think that it's not their age to vulnerable age that is one important thing family history again very important family history smoking obesity inactivity we all these things are contributory our lifestyle our dietary patterns we eat lot of junk food and most of us don't have fruits uh, every day at home to be frank so all these dietary patterns they do have much influence and they, they have preponed uh, by two or three decades the prevalence of cardiac coronary artery disease so we spoke about the various risk factors sir but uh, what's the role of stress in this yeah stress stress i think very important type a by basing on stress they have divided to uh, human personality into type a and type b type a personality is traditionally that is high extreme stress to all the uh, or extreme reactions to our day to day happenings taking extreme stress is definitely making the things worse actually stress aggravates the hypertension stress stress indirectly promotes in way that is a more vascular shear and stress over the vessels also and stress also has some bad impact on the lipid profile as well stress is known to elevate triglycerides also according to some studies so stress definitely plays a role so uh, you told us to go for uh, lipid profile every year once every year uh, can you list out the, the age of 20 uh, can you can you just uh, list out the tests which we are supposed to go as a preventive step every year in a way yeah once uh, you cross 18 years blood pressure monitoring every year once we cross 20 years lipid profile every year apart from lipid profile i would advise a random blood sugar every year and creatinine lipid profile and blood pressure these are the things okay what about uh, the uh, sort of ecg then uh, stress test of tmt and all when do you advise uh, to go for that on an annual checkup yeah ecg and 2d echo we advise generally not for every patient but symptomatic patients Okay. if the patient is having symptoms yes definitely if the patient is having diabetes he needs to get screened every 6 months okay. that is very important and treadmill test every once in 2 years and ecg and tdi echo every 6 months for a diabetic patient or already cardiac patient otherwise symptomatic patients only we go for these testings all right sir thank you one last question uh, nowadays we hear about uh, non invasive uh, test ct angio so what are your views on it versus uh, angiogram yes uh, ct this clear i think this needs to be discussed actually this is a very good uh, thing ct angiogram uh, first of all what is the difference between conventional angiogram and ct angiogram ct angiogram is nothing but a ct scan where they inject dye and they image accordingly so that the when the dye passes through the coronary arteries they take uh, images so ct angiogram is more kind of a screening test and the first step of ct angiogram is ct calcium score assessment so many western countries evidently based on the uh, evidence evidence based medicine 
CT calcium score is a negative risk factor for a patient. For example, if he stands high, diabetic, smoking, family history. But if CT calcium score is zero or less than 100, the score definitely has a role in screening, but not for the diagnosis point of view. So, for example, if a patient has no symptoms and he wants to know his risk, CT calcium score or CTNG is good enough. But a patient who is already having symptoms, there's no point in going CT angio. Better go for directly conventional angio. Because after doing CT angiogram also, we need to reconfirm the severity of the stenosis by conventional angiogram before we treat the disease. So CT is more of screening. Conventional angio is more of therapeutic. Thank you very much, sir. One, uh, one last question regarding uh, silent attacks, uh, how to identify silent attacks. Uh, if the patient is not uh, complaining of chest pain, then what are the other uh, sort of things which we, we should be looking at? Yes, silent ischemia, where we need to see it's diabetic. Diabetic patients, elderly patients, renal failure patients, these are the patients which we, do, which we need to look uh, more keenly for silent ischemia. The symptoms of silent ischemia, a patient might not be having chest pain many times, some kind of giddiness. A doctor has been feeling uneasy since morning, or difficult in breathing, giddiness on exertion is suggestive of more worse disease actually. Somebody is having syncope or a, a transient loss of consciousness on exercise is more worse. And uh, sweating, profuse sweating without any reason. Doctor, I have been sitting in AC, but I had profuse sweating in the morning and a sense of uh, uneasiness. This is how they describe. Instead of chest pain, patient having breathing difficulties, sudden onset of profuse sweating, which is unexplained. And uh, uh, these are the things, vomitings. These, we need, these are the things we need to see. Thank you very much. It was a very informative session, the way you have delivered uh, uh, such a common yet very important topic uh, to create the awareness as well as uh, a sort of uh, a roundup of the uh, roundup of a class on cardiology in a way, the basics of cardiology uh, for the students who participated uh, today. Uh, I thank you again. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was an amazing session, the way you delivered it. Uh, and uh, hopefully everyone uh, will agree with my uh, sort of uh, view on this. And now I request all the participants to submit their uh, feedbacks on the link that is given in the chat box. And uh, uh, like how uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, we conduct these clinical webinars once every fortnight, that is twice a month on second and fourth Saturdays. This time on, uh, uh, we went with cardiology topic uh, on occasion of the World Heart Day. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadeem. Thank, thank you all you. for the patient listening. Uh, with a different topic, uh, this time more, uh, more towards the sort of uh, management of uh, things in a way. Uh, more clinical and uh, a sort of interventional cardiology. I hope uh, we'll go with that topic next time. Okay. Maybe the next series. Yes, <laughs> sure, sure. Huh? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.